morning, welcome to Grace Christian Center. This morning we're going to be talking about the battle of the mind. The battle of the mind. Um, for the Christian, for the unbeliever, for the believer, the battle is all in your mind. Amen? It's not with your brother, it's not with your sister, it's not with your spouse, it's not with the government, it's not with the senators, the congressmen. The battle is within your mind. Sometimes we can be our worst enemy. Amen? Amen? We really can. We can be our worst enemy. Sometimes Satan just stands on the sidelines of life and he looks at us to destroy ourselves. And he didn't have to do anything. That's, right. That's the way it is sometimes. Father God, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would move mightily, Lord, upon your people here, Father, and those listening by, by video, Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them, Lord, that you would reach out to them and love them, Lord, and allow them to see Allow them to see, Lord, who you created them to be, Father. A lot of times, Lord, we lose our way. But, Lord Jesus, you come that we may have life and have life abundantly. And Lord, that's my desire, Lord, because I know that's your desire. That you would move, Lord. Lord, I remove myself out of your way. Lord, may I never say anything that is on my heart or in my mind, but let it come straight from your throne room this morning, Father. We've got to have a fresh word from you, Father. From you this morning. No Holy Spirit, you move. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 If anybody has ever heard of the word sanctification? Amen. Y'all know what that means? Sanctification. Sanctification. Good. Keep that in mind. First scripture will be in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. It says here, Paul wrote this, that in the last day, this was actually Paul's last letter that he wrote to the church before he was murdered, martyred for his faith in Christ. And one of the last things that was on the heart of Paul was about the condition of the church in the last day, which I believe we are that church today. Amen? We are that church today. And he said this in 2 Timothy 3, 5. He said, They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. This was a warning. And if y'all can look up here, it's up here, by the way, if y'all can't find it in your body. But this was a warning that Paul wrote through the Holy Spirit to the church for the ages to come. In the last day, in the last day, chapter 3, verse 1 says, in the last days. He's speaking in context. Paul is speaking about what would happen to the church in the last day. So today, we are that church. And he said that there would be a group of people that would act very religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Not because we're better than them. Not because we're, God looks on us you know, better than He does people who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. No, no, no. That, that's not what it's saying is here. Paul is saying stay away from people like that because that can harm your walk with Christ. You know, we need to be very careful every day with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus said that those who will follow me, they must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me daily. Just like Simon had to carry that cross with Jesus when Jesus was on the road to go out to, you know, to Calvary. There was a man that had to help Jesus carry that cross. And in a sense, Jesus, he was allowing us, the church, to see that we as Christians, we all have to carry the cross. It's a burden. It's not a heavy burden, but it's a responsibility. It's an obligation. And see, we are obligated to Christ. The Bible does say that. We are obligated to Christ. To seek after godliness, to seek after holiness. And a lot of denominations out there, a lot of churches, a lot of preachers who have their own hidden agendas, they'll, they'll, they'll preach a gospel that says something like this, you know, you can accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, confess Him, accept Him, and then you can continue to live the way you want. Well, you know, the Lord does forgive, and the Lord does heal all things. He makes everything brand new. Yes, He does. And He loves us with a passion that none of us will be able to understand. But the Word of God does say that if the name of Jesus will save us, that the power of the Holy Spirit will transform us. Those who are in Christ are a new creation. What you did before the cross will not continue after you've gone with the cross. There's got to be a transformation. Peter, before he knew Jesus as the Savior of the world, resurrected from the dead, he denied Christ three times. He was a coward. But when the Holy Spirit came into him in Acts chapter 2, it transformed him to go before those very same people and preach the gospel, and one day 3,000 people got saved. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. Peter was a believer, even before the cross. He was a believer. He told Jesus, you are the Son of God. But yet, he didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit in him. And that is the way it is with a lot of people. Let's go back to that scripture, 2 Timothy. 
It says they will act very religious, but they will deny the power that can make them godly. What is the power that can make a Christian godly? The Holy Spirit. The people will have the name of Christ, but they will not have the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a game changer in the whole entire life of a Christian. It's the Holy Spirit. He convicts us. He leads us. He guides us. He reminds us. He nurtures us. He encourages us. He strengthens us. It's not by might, not by strength, but what? By His power. Save the Lord. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Paul was saying this. So, if we understand something that we as Christians have an obligation to seek after holiness, after godliness, we cannot do that on our own effort. Because well, if we could, then we didn't need the Holy Spirit. We don't need God. We can save ourselves. Amen? But see, the Bible says, draw near unto me, says God, and I shall what? Draw near unto you. God will do his part, but we must do our part. There's a surrender to our part. It says here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, in the NASB, and the rest of the scriptures will follow in the NASB version. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says, pursue peace with all men. Amen? Oh, all of us are guilty of that. So, but it says, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Another translation says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see God. So, not Michael this morning, but the Word of God this morning is saying, without holiness, we will not see the Lord. Right. Well, wait a minute. Now that, now that has got to get our attention. And you listening by way of video, that has got to get your attention this morning. Without holiness... Well, NASB says sanctification. But there's a tie between sanctification, godliness, and holiness. There's something that ties those words together. Sanctification is a spiritual cleansing. And it's only done by who? The Holy Spirit. And so when the Christian allows the Holy Spirit to move in our life, we begin to understand this is wrong, this is wrong, this is right. This is the will of God. This is not the will of God. Every single one of us, if you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have heard that still small voice in your ear, in your heart. Amen? Amen. Okay. But it's got to first happen in the mind. In the mind. The battle is in the mind. Now, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 through 11, I'm going to read this. Now, I want you to, I'm going to ask you something before we read that. Go ahead and bring that back down. If you can. Thank you. Uh, in Hebrews, we're going to read here shortly. In Hebrews 12, verse 7 through 11. It says here, uh, I want to talk about this. It says, when we go through sanctification, because what does Hebrews 12, 14 say? Without sanctification, no one will see the Lord. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Without sanctification, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without godliness, no one will see the Lord. When you go, if, if, when you go through this, when you go through this, you go through a process of discipline. And it is not fun, is it? I mean, can we be real in the house of the Lord this morning? When, when the Holy Spirit convicts you, when you're growing as a Christian, you, it, it's not fun, is it? Because the things you used to, you know what like, you like to do, amen? amen? You know what pleases John. You know what pleases Dan, but what pleases the Lord? And you see, when we have to learn that what pleases us don't always please God, we have to surrender these things and we have to go after the will of God. And that process right there is called sanctification. Why? Because it leads us into holiness and the godliness, which is something we need, because Scripture says without that, we cannot what? See the Lord. Now, this process can seem very demanding sometimes. God, you're always on my case. And I, I gotta go to church Sunday morning. I gotta go to church at nine. I gotta pray, you know, after my meals, and I'm, I'm it, sometimes it seems routine. Sometimes it seems religious. Amen? When, but that's what Satan wants for, for you to fall into. A, a type of a religion. But it's got to be from the heart. It, it first, it has, in order for the heart to be affected with the relationship with Christ, it's got to hit your mind. I'm going somewhere with this, okay? But it's going to seem like discipline, like, man, it's not easy being a Christian. Let's read this, guys. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. Let's read this. It says, It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good, so that we may what? 
Sharing is what? Holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those, now here we go, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You have to be trained into the ways of God. And, and you know, yes, God teaches you, but you have to put it into practice. Put it into practice. Going to church is practice. Go, praying is a practice. It's a practice, but it's all it's got to affect the mind so that it can really move the heart. And it can be heartfelt. Now, I want you to also understand something. We do not worship as a Christian. You do not ever worship God by feeling. Because if you do, you're going to be up and down all the time. You worship God by what you know. Absolutely 100%, you do not worship God by what you feel. You wake up one morning, praise the Lord! And the next morning you wake up, oh, you know what? Get off of that cycle of life. We do not praise the Lord by what we feel. It is by what we know. I feel like junk this morning. You know, the doctor diagnosed me with this, but his love endures forever. Amen. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. And I will praise the name of the Lord. We worship God by what we know. God, I see the enemy surrounding me, but I know, I know, Father, you are for me. And greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. Amen. 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 Either you're going to believe that or not. We worship God by what we know. The Word says one thing. The world may say something, and the devil may show you something, but God says something else. So we have to come to a point in our mind, what are we going to believe? You know, we have to be trained and practice holiness and godliness. There is something that, all right, think about this right now. Think about this. There is something that you're struggling with right now. And you know it's wrong. And for some of us, that may be a, a variety of different things. But you take that one thing, and when the devil comes at you to tempt you again, whether you fall back into it, it's putting you to the challenge. Put it down. Stop it. And every time it comes back to you, you cast it down in the name of Jesus. And you depend on the Holy Spirit. Whatever it may be. And you cast it down. And you begin to practice this righteousness, this holiness. And guess what happens? You begin to see a supernatural change happen in your life. You begin to see that. For some of us, we have to go there. For some, it's just an instant. I mean, I woke up on a Sunday morning drunk, and I said, you know what? I've had it. Ten years I've been trying hard liquor. Couldn't stop. And all I, I came to a point in my mind says, I'm done. I don't know how to stop, but I want to. And the Lord said, that's all I needed from you, son. I didn't call you to try. I called you to trust. That's exactly what I heard nine years ago. I called you to trust. Not trying me. Trust in my word. And so... I, I trusted in him. And here I am, nine years later, haven't had a sip of it, haven't been tempted by it, because I know what the devil tastes like. And I don't want it. And you've got to make up your mind what you're going to do. You make up your mind what kind of car you're going to drive, who you're going to marry, what kind of cereal you're going to eat, what kind of TV shows you're going to watch, what kind of vacation you're going to take. You've got to make up your mind to serve the Lord. That, it's plain and simple. Right. Jesus said, you're either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Book of Revelation, chapter 3. Wow, Christ said that? Yes, he did. Christ said, you're either hot or cold for me. Moses drew a line in the sand and said, who's for the Lord? Get on this side. Whoever's not, get over there. You're going to die. They died that day. The Bible is, is, is a word of grace and mercy. He loves you so much. He loves you. But if a people reject the grace and mercy of God, there is nothing left but wrath and judgment. And right now, the grace and mercy is wide open to the world. And it's only in the name of Jesus. But one day, that door, and it is soon coming to a close, where there is nothing but wrath and judgment left. We have to take advantage of what God has freely given us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go on. Let's move to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, I told you the battle is in the mind. Amen? The battle is in the mind. I'm going to give you three scriptures that give solid, concrete, proof, evidence, without shadow of a doubt, that the battle is in your mind. And that we, the war is waged in our mind. Here we go. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13. It says, therefore, prepare your what? Minds for action. Keep sober. Meaning, be self-controlled. Be sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ, at the return of Jesus Christ. Amen? As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. Meaning, before you knew Jesus at the cross, you were living in ignorance. You were doing things. You know, Jesus died on the cross and he looked down and he was saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They were now the Messiah to the cross, not even realizing that. But in, in their stupid 
witness. It was bringing them life. Because they were going to believe in the resurrected Savior. But you see, sometimes us, we do some things in ignorance before the cross. Amen? And so as a Christian, we're not called to conform back to that. The Bible says only a dog returns to his vomit. And see, that's what sin is. When you surrender, sin, you, you surrender, you're throwing it up. Uh, uh. Who's seen a dog return and eat his vomit? Yes, you have seen that. It's disgusting, ain't it? And that's what God views people, Christians, going back to sin as. Something you know that is wrong. See, the word that God is saying here, prepare your mind for action. Why? Because God is going to call you to put something into practice. It is practice. You've got to put holiness and godliness, which is sanctification, through the Holy Spirit in the practice. You cannot do this on your own. You do your part. The Holy Spirit, He kicks in and He'll do His part. Draw near unto me and I shall draw near unto you. Amen? You have not because you ask not. Ask and you shall receive. Amen. Oh, that excites me. I don't know that excites you all. Amen. As obedient children, verse 14, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One, God Almighty, who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Wow, you shall be holy. God, this is a declaration that God gives. You shall be holy. Not you might be holy or you better be holy. You shall be holy. Just like when God said, let there be light, there was light. You know, nothing could stop God from doing what God was going to do. And the Lord looks at you, Christian, and you listen by video, Christian. The Lord looks at you and He says, let there be light. Let there be holiness. Let there be godliness. Let there be life. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus comes that you may have life and have life abundantly. If anybody is going through depression, frustration, confusion, anger, that's your fault. Don't blame it on God. Don't blame it on the devil. That's your fault. Because God has given you every promise and blessing that you can walk in today only through Jesus. You can have life today. You gotta make up your mind what you're gonna do. Let's go to the next scripture. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. This is a little uh, uh, state driven into heart here. This is one of my favorite scriptures that I've lived by. Romans 12, 2. It says that do not be conformed to this world. Do not look like the world. Do not have an image of the world. But what? Be transformed by what? Renewing of your mind. So that you may what? Prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. As a Christian, what are we called to do? Prove the will of God. You know what makes me so sick? When I go on the road, I see a bumper sticker that, bumper sticker that says, I'm, I'm not perfect, just forgiven. You know what that really says? I'm forgiven and I can do what I want to do. I'm going to sin sometimes, but God will forgive me. When the Bible says in 1 Peter, be holy, for I am holy. We are to seek after holiness. We are to seek after godliness. And it's through the Holy Spirit He leads us into that. Just like the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. See, Satan will tempt you, but God will test you. And just like the Holy Spirit led the Lord Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you into that wilderness too. And He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Jesus said it. I will not leave you as orphans. I will send the Holy Spirit. He will be with you, what, Christian? To the very end of the world. To the very end of your life. You're not alone. You don't have to sit in your house and cry because your husband left you or your wife left you or because you've got cancer-ridden body or, or because your kids are just going straight to hell in a handbasket. You don't have to cry. You have a Savior who sees everything, who knows everything, who knows every hair on your little big head, whatever you got. He knows. He knows. Why, why doubt? Why choose to live in, in frustration? Why? That blows my mind away. Why? We have, we have a God. Look, look at the world. Look how everything is in order. The sun knows when to come up and go down. The moon knows how long to shine. The, the tide knows how far to come. I mean, and God put all that in motion. Every star. All the galaxies. I mean, God put that in motion. And He can't handle our little, measly little situations. Mm. Oh, Jesus said, don't worry about these things. The birds don't care about where they get their food from. They wake up in the morning and they're singing and they're chirping and they're happy. And they just go out and there it is. Thank you, 
bother the birds. And aren't you more important than a bird? Yes, you are. We have got to choose, make up our mind, if we're going to live in victory, and that victory is only in the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, or we're going to live in defeat. We've got to choose. We've got to choose. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have a choice. You can either look like the world, and the Bible says, by the way, that the world is passing away. First Peter. The world and the desires of the world are passing away. Or, you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you can be a prover of the Word of God, you can be a doer of the Word of God, and you can show what is good and acceptable and perfect. And you can yield a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Hebrews chapter 12, don't go there, but Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, it says at the end of that scripture, it says, so that you will yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. When you do this process of holiness, of godliness, of sanctification, the benefit is a peaceful fruit of righteousness. You have peace in your life. People will see the patience and the kindness and the generosity that God has put in your life. You're not running around with your head cut off, you know, with a chicken with like your head cut off. And everyone's running around. And, you know, it's kind of like people trying to rearrange the chairs on the Titanic and it, as it was going down. Yeah. It was just chaos and nonsense. But, but you, got, got, you know what's going to happen, you know, and you fear nothing. For you know who the Lord your God is. Another scripture that talks about the mind is Romans chapter 8. Verse 5 through 14. It says this. It says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. You hear that? The battle is always going to be in your mind. But those who are according to the Spirit, they, the things of the Spirit, they set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In John chapter 4, Jesus told a woman at the water well, There are many kind of worshipers, but there's only one that the Father seeks after and that he accepts. In John 4. And said, Those who worship in spirit and in truth. Now, how does our mind get set on, on the things of God, on the will of God? It's by the Spirit of God. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So when our mind is on Jesus, when our mind is on the Holy Spirit of God, we are going to be led into some pretty good places. Amen? We're going to be led into some pretty good places. And guess what? Your children will be blessed. Your children will be blessed. You know, people tell us all the time, your children are so good. And I'm like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> it's all Jesus. But you know what? Pray for them because they're raising over you. You know, we can, all of us, all of us, can get caught up by the devil in a, in a twinkle of an eye. All the devil needs is a little foot, a little pinky toe. And he can do a wonders in your in your life. Don't ever take credit, guys. So don't ever put yourself on a pedestal. Be humble about what the Lord is doing in your life. Persevere. You're not finished until, until you hear that final bell, until you hear that trumpet call of God. You gotta persevere. You know, look around what God has entrusted you with. You know, as me as a pastor, look what God has entrusted me with. When you as a child of the Most High God, as a Christian, you have been entrusted with so much. And we cannot fail God. We cannot fail each other. When you get your eyes off of yourself and your own life situations, and you start doing things for the glory of God and wanting to help others, God will heal your life as you're doing this for others. And you're going to see a wonderful work of God in your life. That's the way it always has been, and that's the way it always is going to be. Because when God moves, He doesn't just move just for one person. He moves for a multitude. In verse 9, do we have that up there? Verse 9? Yes, thank you. However, <coughs> see, there's a however. The, 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 the writer here, Paul, says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. He's speaking to the Christian. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Jesus Christ, he does not belong to Christ. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. What does this mean? What does this mean? This means what? That though we are living in this mortal body, 
And we're always going to have to deal with the flesh. we got two parts to us. The spirit and the flesh. We're always going to be tempted to sin in the flesh. Amen? Amen. Amen. Every, every Christian knows this. Amen? But we have a promise. And I'll read it again in verse 12 here in just a minute. But there's a promise. That though we have this battle always within us, God says that I will help you along the way. And you will have life. Even though you're living in a body that is decaying, could be decaying by cancer. It could be decaying by things in the world. You know, not, not, not unresponsible things, but just things that have, you have no control over. You know, God says you're, you're, you're drawing closer and closer to eternal life as you live as a Christian in this world. And God says God's going to bless you for this. He's going to honor you for this. Verse 12, it says, So then, brethren, we are under obligation. You hear that? Brethren, this is a Christian talking to the church. He refers to the people, the reader, as brothers, as sisters. He says, we are under obligation. Christian, we just missed that. We have a responsibility to Christ. We are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live the way we want to live, to do what we want to do. No. But we are under obligation to live according, not to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must what? die. Not just a physical death one day, but a spiritual death. And see, this is the big picture that the Christian needs to get. Get your mind off of the physical death. There is a second death, and it's a spiritual death, and it's those who are eternally separated from God. And God does not want that for nobody, nobody, nobody. God created hell and the lake of fire for no human being but for Satan and his fallen angels. People go to hell because they choose to reject the relationship with Jesus Christ. And God will honor their decision. If people didn't want to live on this earth in a relationship with God, and they die, what other choice would God have to give them? God's going to honor their decision. God is a good God. He will always honor what you want. Always. For some, it's a life on this earth rejecting a relationship with Christ. So when you die, God will honor what you want. Isn't that a just God? Why would it would be so unfair for God to force Jesus on somebody who lived their whole life rejecting him? That would be so unfair for God to do that. But he is a fair God. It goes on to say, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live by the Spirit through sanctification, which leads you into holiness and the godliness. Through sanctification, you are putting to death the deeds of the body. You're going to live. You're going to live. Now that's the good news. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I gave you three scriptures. At 1 Peter 1, Romans 12, and Romans 8 that talked about the mind. The battle... It's in the mind. Amen? The battle is in the mind. you got to make up your mind if you're going to serve Christ or not. you got to make up your mind. You know, you have friends that, that live like hell. And then you see on this side, God is wanting to open up a whole new life for you. you got to choose. When Jesus died on the cross, there were two men. One on the right, one on the left. One rejected him, and the other one at the very last breath said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. One had life, one had death. That was very symbolic. There's a reason why the Lord did that. Because He wants us to look at the cross, the three crosses, knowing that life is in the middle, but you have to choose one or the other. You have to choose to be with that thief who rejected Christ or that thief who accepted Christ. We're all sinners. Both of them were sinners. And God knew their situation. God knew that they were up there for a reason. But He loved them. He loved them to the very end of their life. He gave them an option. One chose the wrong, and one chose the right. And it happened to the thief of his mind. He made up his mind at the very end of his life. I know I'm wrong, and now I choose life. I choose you, Christ. I choose you. That is the incredible display of love that Jesus has for us all. We don't have to live in defeat anymore. We don't have to live in failure, in compromise of sin in our life. We don't have to live like that. But there are such incredible opportunities that God is putting into the church 
for his people today. If you're a musician, it's an awesome thing to serve the Lord. I was a musician pretty much my whole life. And one thing that kept me back from the Lord was music. But the Lord opened up a whole new thing for me, and I couldn't imagine playing for the world anymore. Couldn't imagine that. Oh, the Lord is so good. The Lord is so awesome in His ways. It says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2-10, through 10, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. Now we know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as He is pure. The Christian purifies himself just as God is pure. Why? Because the Word also says, Be holy because I am holy. So we need to understand, are we going to enter, Christian, into that process of sanctification, which leads you into holiness and the godliness so that you can see the Lord? Or are we going to keep rejecting that? I believe the person that keeps rejecting sanctification, don't get upset with me, but you need to get saved. Because I believe when someone confesses Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they are forever changed. The name of Jesus will save you, but the power of the Holy Spirit will transform you. If you're still living, if you're still living, if you're still living, if you're still living like you are before you met Jesus, you need to get saved. It wasn't a heartfelt. You know, when two people come up to get married, and they say, oh, baby, I love you. Oh, I love you too, baby. Oh, I love you. And then they sign the dotted line. They exchange the wedding ring. And then the man and the woman both run off every now and then, every six months. They have a sexual escapade with somebody else. And then they come back together and try to make it work. And they, they don't know about the adultery. I mean, that's not love. You know what that's called? That's called conditional love. I will do things on these conditions. But you see, when you experience an agape love, a godly kind of love, an unconditional love, then that, that will allow you to honor your commitment to God, to everybody else. And that, my friend, right there, will transform your life into somebody brand new. Because the Bible says, those who are in Christ are what? A new creation. You're no longer who you used to be. You're no longer Peter the coward who denied Christ three times. You're now Peter the Great who preached the Word and 3,000 people got saved. Amen. There's got to be a transformation. It's biblical. It's biblical. The thief on the cross, he never spoke Jesus as the Messiah. But there, there, was, there, was, there was evidence. He said, Lord, forgive me. You know, Remember me when you come into your kingdom, into paradise. You know, Remember me, Lord. There's got to be a transformation and it's got to be visible by all. That, it has to be. It's biblical. So, with that in mind, I'm going to take you to the last scripture that we're going to read. Go with me to Luke chapter 8. Now, what did I say the battle is? Where's the battle? In your mind. Amen? Go with me to Luke chapter 8. Go to verse 26. And say amen when you get there. Amen? Give me a time to drink some water. Luke chapter 8, verse 26. Say amen when you get there. I'm going to do some amen. Luke chapter 8, verse 26. Alright, let's read this. Then they sailed to the country of the, of, of the how do you say that? Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city, Jesus was. He was met by a man who was possessed with demons and who had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but in the tombs. This man was possessed by demonic spirits. He was naked all the time. What, no, not, not just... Hear me out, okay? Why do you think, why do you think people that live in the world don't like to have much clothes on? It's a demonic characteristic. When you see people in, in American music and secular worldly music, when you see people and in, in famous people in movies, that they, they like to show skin, they like to show a lot of sensuality and everything. They, 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 don't, they, they don't dress modestly. Because the Bible says dress modestly. Why? Because it is a char demonic characteristic. When you want to strip your clothes off, when you want to show your body, it's a demonic characteristic. Now, that's a whole other... And I, could get, I, took a, I took a class in seminary, Bible seminary, called Demonology. I got A in that class. I can go. I can talk about some demons. And, and we can go there. But, but, but let me just say this. It says here, 
that this man was naked and he lived in the tombs. He lived in the graves. When, when you are living in sin, when you are living in such filth, you're in dead places. You know, not, not necessarily hanging out at the grave sites, but, but going to the bars, going to the clubs, you know, going go, go to places where, where there is no life. It's like a tomb. When you're so far from God, when your mind is totally shut off from God, you're under the control of demonic spirits. You really are. Now, Hollywood will tell you, in order to have demonic spirits in you, you got to be foaming at the mouth, ah, and twisting your head like that, like the exorcist. That is so far from the truth. Demonic spirits do not want to be cast out. Therefore, they do not manifest themselves a lot of the time. And the people that even have them in them don't even realize they have demonic spirits in them. Because to think about it. Demonic spirits do not want to be cast out of bodies. And when they see that a Christian finds them in there, and the Christian has the power through the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, to cast these demons out, these demons are in trouble. And they don't want to be cast out. So a lot of times, the norm is that people who have demonic spirits in them don't even know it themselves. And they walk around, and they do crazy things. And I've prayed with many men in prison who have, their hands have murdered people. And they told me themselves, I don't even remember doing that. But you did. Because demonic spirit possession is real right now more than ever before. And there are people that have come into this building there are people throughout the ministry that I've met with that have <clears throat> demonic spirits, and they, were, they, they, were, they seem to have a sound mind, they seem to be fine and everything, but they did evil, and people say, why do you do that evil things? Because they're led by spirits. Now, when Jesus met this man for a reason, now I want to hurry up and finish this. Verse 28, seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. That is awesome. This demon knew who Jesus was. Even demons shudder at the name and the sight of Jesus Christ. This demon, whoa, whoa, don't torture me. I, I, I beg you. Christian, you don't have to live in fear no more. You don't have to live in compromising of sin in your life. Make your mind up today. Who are you going to serve? This demon screamed, verse 29, says, For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times. You hear that? It came on him, and then it would go away. It would come on him, and then it would go away. It would come on him, and then it would go away. Just like the Spirit of God does to you sometimes. Amen? Has anyone ever had felt the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God? And it just comes upon you, and you're like, praise the Lord. And then you start doing some crazy things, awesome things for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Demonic spirits work the same way, too, by the way. Anyways, it says here, the spirit had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Why is it that, that people, they go from place to place to place? Look, people that don't know Christ, they live from place to place to place to place. It's a demonic trait. You can never settle down and grow roots like a good tree could. And when the hurricane comes and the storm comes, those big trees can stand because they've stayed in place and they've grown some roots. That's in the foundation and the kingdom of God. I'm going somewhere with this, guys. This... This man was a wanderer. Well, when, when Cain killed his brother Abel, what did God tell Cain? You're going to be a wanderer. You're cast out. Because Cain was under the control of Satan. He was a wanderer. And this man had the same characteristics of demonic possession. He was a wanderer. We can look at people today who don't know Jesus Christ. They go from job to job to job, from place to place to place, living, living here, living there, living there, going from this relationship to this relationship to this relationship, going from this person to this. It's a demonic characteristics. There is more demonic possession happening today than ever before in the history of the world, ever. And if you were to look at the world today and put a spiritual radar of all the demonic spirit activity on the world, the most heavily demonic activity experience you would find right now would be in the United States of America. Because this is the battlefield. This is the final stronghold. There are more people coming to Christ in third world countries than there are in America. America is so polluted, deluded, and disoriented by demonic possession. 
But Jesus knew who this man was. And Jesus went to this man for a reason. Let's read it. Look, verse 30. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? Like Jesus didn't know. But I love the way Jesus plays out the formality of things. Amen. He says, what is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. I don't care how many demons you're up against. Jesus can handle them all. Amen. I don't care how many problems you've got. Jesus can cast them all down in his name. I don't care if all the gates of hell come against you. Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. And you, my friend, are the church. Walk in that blessing today. It is your privilege, right, to receive that and to put that into practice. Amen. Make your mind up. But you know Goes on to say here in verse 31. They were imploring him not to command them to, to go away into the abyss. They knew. The demons, they knew where they were going. Why do you think this demonic possession is so incredible today? Because they know their time is near. It's short. Revelation chapter 12. It says that Satan was cast down to the earth and woe to the earth. Why? Because he knew his time is short. Revelation 12 says that. And he went out and he made war against the rest of the saints. Those who confessed and hold testimony to the name of Jesus Christ. There's a great demonic warfare going on right now. That's why the book of Ephesians says you're not in battle with flesh and blood, but with powers of what? Darkness. Your battle is with darkness, and sometimes your battle is within yourself, because your mind is in darkness and not in the light. Everybody else has come out of the closet. The homosexual, you know, the head, I mean, all of God's enemies have come out of the closet. But the Christian's running in the closet. And I'm not saying we got to come out and we got to fight. Our enemy is not with flesh and blood. We need to love homosexuals to the cross. We need to love murderers to the cross. Amen. I had a murderous heart before I met Jesus. But we need to love people to the cross of Jesus Christ. And I know you listen by way of video. You know, and there's some that listen in, on England. And I, I thank you for listening. But your nation is about to be overrun. And you know what I'm talking about. Your nation is about to be overrun by people who have a hatred heart towards God, towards Jesus Christ. And that is soon going to come to the United States of America. And it's going to come faster than you think. We're there, my friend. It says here in verse 32, Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine, the pig. And he gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and was drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it to the city and out in the country. And the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it reported to them how the man who had demon, been, demon possessed had been made well. And all the people of the country of Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked Jesus to leave. For they were gripped with great fear and he got into a boat and returned. A lot of times when you see Jesus move in your life, you're either going to draw nearer to God and sit at the feet of Jesus or you're going to say, leave Jesus, I don't want no part of this. And sometimes when people come into this church, they know the power of God is in this place. And yet they're either going to draw closer to God or they're going to never come back to this church. It's not because of me. It's not because of the music. It's not because of the prayer partners. It's because the Holy Spirit is in this place. And so when the hand of God moves, you've got a decision to make. This man, he was beyond help of any kind of psychologist, of any kind of help. But Jesus knew who he was. And Jesus took a boat. And Jesus went over there. And Jesus met this man. And Jesus touched this man. And Jesus cast the pig, I mean these demons into the pigs. And they, they went out from the midst of this man. And the Bible says that this man was now clothed and in his right mind. The battle is in your mind. The battle is in your mind. Demonic spirits want to 